Recording is on. So first of all, I wanted to just start by saying congrats on the first commit to the Planet Repository. I know Thank we've you. been working together for some time now and you've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes, but it's cool to have you actually going and putting that in um, directly. So that, that's great. Um, congrats on that. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, do you, do you want to take, do you like want to go over some of the work that's in that commit? I know we had kind of gone over it before when it was outside of Plenty. I don't know if we want to look at that at all. Um, and then I know you had some errors doing some stuff in Plenty too. So I don't know if you want to take a look at that together. Yeah, it's pretty much the same as we, the same base for the authentication. Mm -hmm. The additional thing that was the Svelte stores and the user object that I added. Okay. And configs and so on. Yeah. Although yeah. I noticed, I noticed that bug that I reported. That yeah. Repository just uh, like an hour ago. And so was the bug if you if you don't successfully authenticate in GitLab, there's a, a problem. Is that yeah. what's happening? Okay. Yeah. If it, there's problem with the redirect URL, for example, uh, the user ch is just stuck in the GitLab authentication page, and if if he or her goes back, then the state, then it tries to finish the authentication, but there's no authentication authorization code. Oh, okay. Right. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. It, it and, should and, be easily fixed, but yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. We could, do, do you want to take a, do you have your um, computer set up to look at any of this stuff or? Yeah. We can take a look together. I have the branch that I can demo, demo the um, content editor and publishing. Thing. Oh. Yeah, let's take a look at that. I didn't know how much progress you had on that. Yeah, I'm definitely excited to, to see what's happening now. One, one of the pages that I'm at currently, but sure. I don't think on it. Um, So here's the plenty repository, mm -hmm. and I've added this publish.js file that I'm working on currently. Sure. Committing to the GitLab Git uh, repository. Great. It's currently just like hard coded with the messages and actions and so on, mm -hmm. but it takes the content from the content editor that I have added and file path from the content variable. Okay. And it looks like this. I, I've shown shown this before to you, this content mm -hmm. editor. Yeah. But now the publish button does actually something. Wow, okay. It, it it's, isn't visual, the error reporting isn't visual yet, but sure. Uh, if I change, for example, this paragraph to test two, mm -hmm. it publish. It should say successfully published. Okay. It's not pulling it automatically to the local environment, but yeah. When I go back to the uh, Visual Studio Code, I synchronize. Give my password. I should have a new commit. Uh, no, this is <laughs> that was the plenty repository. Oh yeah, yep, yep. Here, if I git fetch, for example, there's new change. Awesome! To Whoa. Okay, so that actually is writing to the the remote GitLab repository then. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That's great. And if I pull it again, password, mm -hmm. uh, password protected SSH key. So, yeah, yeah. Now refresh. Refresh. You should have space. it. Wow. Okay, that's sweet. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I, I think this. Is, I was having some problems with my GitLab CI build. So, I, you know, mm -hmm. I don't, obviously this, you know, you did this locally, pushed the repository and then pulled yeah. it locally and, and did it. Um, so, so yeah, have you, um, 
have you done this on a deployed uh, site at all yet? I don't no, know if you... I'm not. I'm not so familiar with GitLab deployment. Or... Yeah. Where to host it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So perfect. there's like um, and don't worry about that. I'm just talking right now. Like what you're doing right now here is perfect. Um, I, I there is like GitLab pages, and I had some documentation on the Plenty site, but I recently was trying to push a couple projects I'm working on to it, and um, that documentation I think is outdated with its API because the the CI runners seem to be blowing up. So I got to do some investigation there to fix that, anyways. Um, but this yeah. is great. So, um. Yeah, do you want to walk through the code a little bit more? Like this, this looks so so good. It's exactly what I was um, hoping we'd get to. You got to, you got there a lot faster than I thought we would. Yeah. Um, well, there's the authentication rework. You do you want to go through that or just that? Um, maybe briefly. Yeah. So that's the stuff that got, that you did a, a commit to the Plenty project, right? Yeah. Is, is yes, okay. Yeah. Great. And then this this new stuff is not pulled in yet, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Got these are not these three commits. Gotcha. These are okay. only in my repository. Yeah, maybe it's worth going not through not the rework not. just quickly. I, I know we kind of gone through it before, so we don't have to belabor it. But if you want to go at the top, yeah, like so a high level. In this, it's mostly about the authentication file. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of new stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's the user object. Yep. This here is a getter for it that has um, some variables and uh, functions to authenticate, mm -hmm. like login and logout and pins authentication. Yep. And so for people who aren't familiar, this is basically wrapping up everything into one uh, yeah. magic prop, right? So if you want to log in or log out, you use the user um, prop. And then if you want to check if you actually have a valid user, you, you would do like user dot is authenticated or something along those lines, right? Yeah. Uh, it's actually used in the HTML file. Perfect. Like so, checking Perfect. if the variable actually exists and, uh -huh. and using the store stores value. The user is a store. Uh huh. And so maybe this is it's authenticated. And maybe this is me just not being familiar with JavaScript. Are you using the dollar sign to denote a store value, or is there a special it's, meaning to this? It's felt it's felt store uh, syntax. Oh, okay. It's for fetching the store value. If you oh, okay. dollar sign before a variable, uh, it fetches its value and updates its. Um, oh. Like, so you not you don't have to pull it in explicitly. You don't have to do like a getter or something. <laughs> but, oh, sorry. Yeah. What was it? Uh, that word. So um, like um. Yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. What's that? Um. I'm just trying to some find the word. Uh, mm. Not recursive, not responsive, but <laughs> oh, reactive. Reactively, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it's like a shortcut syntax. Then basically, is that what's happening here with the? Yeah, it's subscribing to the store, and the syntax uh -huh. is subscribing to the store and returning the value here. Okay, very cool. I didn't know that. That's great. So I've done. In the authentication file, there's actually, I mean, actually, it, this is a JS file. So mm -hmm. I'm using stores here manually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the subscribe to get the value mm -hmm. when it updates. Yeah, so that's how I'd always use stores. I'd always... To a variable. Yep, yep. That's the way I had already, I didn't know there was a, a short, a shorter way to do it. I'd always done the the subscribe methods. Um, that's yeah. great. This, this is cool. Okay. It's documented for Svelte docs. So awesome. You can Great. also always look at that, those. And yeah. That's great. And then these changes, you were actually, you know, you're putting them in the Plenty project. Look, like I saw in your terminal, you're actually building them and testing them out to see. Mm -hmm. um, I know a couple of people that contributed before, they, they weren't really familiar with Go. So they'd kind of blindly put it in there. And then the testing would be on me to take a look to, to make sure it was working. It's great that you're actually going through and building with Go. Um, how's that experience been for you? Has it been intuitive? Has it been challenging? Well, it hasn't been very difficult because it's I get get the idea behind the virtual file system and yeah, and Go is very similar to build like C C, but okay. way easier. 
Yeah. 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 It's, it has a very small footprint of yeah. some deaths. <laughs> some people hate that. Um, I like it cause I'm, I'm simple minded. Um, cool. Okay. So this is great. Um, do you want to look at the, um, is there anything else you want to look at here? Or do you want to hop over and take a look at some of the editor, um, commit stuff? Um, not really just the book with the reference tokens. I actually waited long enough to, <laughs> Oh. I came back to the computer and it, it tried to refresh the token. Okay, great. So it, it, it works. These settings and uh, this was wrong. Oh, okay. And, yeah. and I'm curious. I'm curious what that um, experience looks like. So, like, okay, so you so you went away from your computer. Your your token goes stale. You come back to it. Um, do you, you for example, the... refresh a page and it's already there, there that's all it is you just refresh yeah. you don't have to like log it go does, back to GitLab or anything no, like that it does all the, all all in the background because Great. you're already logged into GitLab, or you don't have to be logged into GitLab actually because mm -hmm. refresh token is the is the like token that you um that holds the login login state basically mm -hmm. And then you're you're checking that by basically expect like I'm um, looking at your local storage and, and seeing that the token's different. That's how that's how you know it was valid, right? Um, there's ex expiration date for the token. Uh -huh. Gotcha. So uh, here's the is expired uh, variable. Gotcha. So there's yeah. created that and expires in. Uh huh. That's returned from GitLab. Okay. Okay. So I'm checking that they are if they are like if current time is more than the expire expired expiration date mm -hmm. yeah yep that makes sense um great well i'm glad that's working that's that's good i i feel like that's one of the things that someone would definitely run into at some point if we didn't have that working so um mm -hmm. yeah that's great so it's because it's um, storing the tokens to the local storage is actually persisting the login as long as the, set, the content is basically available. That unless um, the user um, clears the storage or something, mm -hmm. it be locked in. Yeah, so I'm interested. Uh, what happens if someone closes out of their browser and does not go to it for a while? The next time they go to that site is, I, I assume the the local, the local storage, because session well, storage does not persist uh, um, across tabs, right? But the local storage will persist even if yeah, you close your browser, right? Local storage will persist between sessions also. Mm -hmm. So, so if how closes the browser then and comes back to it, uh, opens it again, mm -hmm. then it will still have the same values in the store. Okay. Storage. So is there, is there ever any instance where the person logs out in without clicking the logout button? Or is there any kind of like, with the, you know, mm -hmm. with it being in local storage and with the refresh token being, if I don't touch it or look at a site for a while, is there any mechanism that logs me out or no? Well, uh, if the, uh, the access token is expired, uh -huh. And this is variable is true, uh -huh. and we try to refresh it. And for some reason, we cannot refresh it. Then it should log out, log okay. out. But um, yeah, currently it tries to refresh it. Yeah, <laughs> refresh it like forever. Probably. Yeah, yep. Should look into it too. Yeah. This is in the weed stuff. I'm I'm not, I mean, sure, but you know, with the ultimate goal of all this stuff, these are all things we have to think about right now. Uh, it's mm -hmm. like one of my least concerns just because yeah. we have so many big things to, to push uphill. Um, but yeah, good, good to be thinking about it. Um, yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, should we take a look at editors? Yeah. Awesome. So cool. I've added the content editor component. Mm -hmm. Jesse, is there any chance you could bump up your um, editor like maybe one, one or two magnification without making oh, it too yeah. hard for you to see? Awesome. Is it good? Uh, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. 
So I will just open the file. Um, currently, I'm loading the code mirror uh, dependency mm -hmm. from Unc package with dynamic import. Mm -hmm. But uh, because there's, uh, I don't know how else to do it because every every else method gives me errors. Uh huh. Like importing okay. with import statement, it tries to load it from file system and yeah. Uh, putting a uh, script tag. Uh, there was some problem with script tag. Well, okay. Synchronizing, wait, waiting for the loading or something. So this was the only option. Currently. Okay. Um, well, I'm glad that you got something working. Yeah. It, it, if um, I'm, I'm happy to look at some of the other ones, like if you're trying to use NPM or, or whatever, yeah. and it's not working, I'm happy to, to try to take a look at that and see what's going on. But I'm glad that something's working for now, so it didn't hold you up too much. Just the npm packages uh, work now. Oh, they do. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do they? Oh, they they should. They should in general, yeah. but um, yeah. They, they. I mean, well, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of different ways to 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 import, and and oh. these things are there's so many different patterns. So it, it should work, yeah, but sure. uh, yeah, we'll see. This won't probably work because. This using a is this using AMD so asynchronous module definition syntax or something or UMD universal module definition syntax. Oh, so it's yeah. not it's not a X, ECMAScript module. Yeah, so so we yeah the way we're doing it is we're requiring ECMAScript modules. So. Mm. So we so previously the way I was trying to gather ESM the ECMAScript modules um, was really stupid. I was just like kind of going through and blindly like looking for files and pulling them in, and it didn't make sense. Now since um, the the issue that you had flagged in GitHub that I had worked through, uh, we're we're actually doing is we're going and we're reading the package JSON um, for the dependencies, and then we're finding where their module entry points are, and then getting yep. them. Of course, it depends on the module uh, maintainer to actually have some kind of ESM support. We're not actually doing any of the conversion, although that's something that I was thinking we could add in the future because uh, ES build actually has some transform options. So they have the bundler side of things, right? But they also have some transform options for um, transforming common JS to ESM. So uh, in the future, we might be able to, even if the, the NPM module maintainer doesn't add that support, we could possibly add it ourselves. Um, for now, that's not there. True. So yeah, because this definitely does support uh, common JS module export. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does it? I wonder if it has. Oh, so so it's okay. I get what you're saying. Um, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, that's interesting that you're able to pull in that version. Um, yeah, but it's working for you. Yeah, dynamic imports doesn't go through the. Uh, what was it? Um, what compiler was it? Transpiler. So oh, I mean, oh, yes, but yeah, yeah, it's just yes, like doing its own. Yeah, yeah exactly. They, yeah, we they don't care about the in, dynamic imports. They yeah. only do it for uh, like they defer it to the browser to use. Yeah, yep, that's probably why. Yeah, and in yeah. in the, the the Go pack stuff that I did too, I basically when I see the dynamic import, I don't do much with it. Yeah, um, so that's probably why. <laughs> so maybe it's for the best <laughs> in this case. Yeah. Um, most comp uh, most bundlers actually use it for code splitting. So, mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So there, I mean, there's there's some things to be desired in some of those things. Um, it's challenging. JavaScript's a very expressive mm. language. There's so many different ways to do similar things. Um, so building tool, I I don't envy people who build tooling, um, like like bundlers and things. Those those things are pretty complicated. Um, mm. Anyways, uh, sure. So at least we got something working here. I can look into if Jesse, if you want to, if there's any um, specific cases where you're like, okay, I tried to pull this in with npm and it's not working. Let me know, and I, I'll, I'll take a look at that too. Uh, feel free to throw an issue in the queue. Yeah. But back to the editor. Mm -hmm. So I I wait I wait until the library is loaded and then initialize the editor, mm -hmm. code run editor with JavaScript mode. So Great. it supports JSON out of the box. Great. Uh, not not out of the box. There's different uh, separate module for it, but 
Mm -hmm. almost <laughs> yeah <laughs> out of the other box out of the other box yeah <laughs> um then on we i listen to the on change um event to update the content variable mm -hmm. so it updates the user interface as as you write the editor mm -hmm. it tries to parse it but if you have a syntax error it just doesn't care about it it doesn't update the fields but if, if it has some other error then it will throw it gotcha because you could technically break your json or sorry your um yeah your json like in the editor if you if you like remove the curly bracket or something right and that's yeah. that's kind of catching that okay so so if i has have a, like a colon here uh -huh. it work anymore yep yeah I can, okay i can change this text but it's not up, update to the ui because there's uh -huh. yeah makes sense cool um and the other way around, if if the content changes somewhere else, then I set the value to the editor. Mm -hmm. and, and sorry, can you explain that a little bit? So if the content changes somewhere else? Yeah. Actually, hmm. I don't actually remember why I have this, have this editor doesn't have, have focus. Oh, I could see that. Okay, so so for instance, you could click a button on a page that changes text on the oh, page, yeah. and you'd want yeah. your editor to see that too. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yep. Um, cool. Oh, well, that's great. It feels like when I showed you the prototype for the CMS, then mm -hmm. then it would uh, not would change this editor also. Yeah. If you yeah. change the value for the field. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Mm. And then there's the submit function that mm -hmm. calls the publish function. Yeah. Um, and there's the ascent. Actually, <laughs> I left this. Oh, oh this is style sheet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It has to be here. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's kind of for, for like the editing experience. That's that's necessary. Yeah. Okay. Great. And yeah, and I'm really curious, kind of like what that submit process is like. Um, after you you know you make some changes, you see them kind of reflected in the UI, and then you submit, and that's making a commit back. I'm kind of curious how, how yeah. that API interaction is like. And how complicated that stuff is. Yeah, it's actually not that complicated. That's great. That's always what I like to hear. <laughs> it's I can fit it into one <laughs> screen. Okay, awesome. Currently, because it's there's a lot of hard coding like the branch and sure comic message, but sure. Yeah, at some point we'll you know we'll have to yeah. think about that stuff. But um, yeah, that's that's great. So first of all, there's we have to get the user object. Mm -hmm. So because this is JavaScript file, we use the subscribe mm -hmm. uh, subscribe to the store and i've created a promise for when the user is available mm -hmm. so when the subscribe returns something i don't know if this is actually necessary because um, subscribe should return Im immediately mm. it just uh just fall fall back I don't, I don't know. It's not guaranteed that it will return probably. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because and so the, po and the point of, so we want to gather the current user because, you know, multiple people could be logging in. We want to make sure we know who's committing to the repo. Is that what we're kind of setting up to do here with the current user no, stuff? No, it's the, if, if there's no, if there's, for example, login in progress, then mm -hmm. the user changes. So we have to uh, subscribe to the user store. And mm -hmm. the store doesn't probably, or does, I don't know, immediately return to your current user. 
Hmm, okay. And we have the promise to tell us when when the user is available. So we in the publish function we can await it. Okay. Wait until the user is available. Gotcha. Okay. So so we need a promise there to, to set up this basically the sequencing of events so we don't try to do yeah. this stuff before the user's ready. Is that what we're thinking yeah. here? Okay. I think and it would probably work without the promise, but <laughs> yeah, it's better this way, I think. Okay. Um, I, I should probably check it from the Svelte API if this runs immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be good to know. I guess like if there's ever a chance to simplify things it, yeah. without compromising on functionality, it's always a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, then we check if the current user is authenticated mm -hmm. and throw an error if it isn't, if, if he, he or she isn't. Yep. Yep. And, and yeah. And then odds are, so that would be in the case of somehow, because, you know, typically if someone's not authenticated, they wouldn't be able to see the editor at all. Right. So this is maybe yeah. someone who was authenticated, who no longer is, but is seeing the editor somehow. Is that what we're thinking? Not really. It's if this function is used elsewhere. Uh, and, like directly. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. And it's just a, just a guard, guard that the, it doesn't do anything that it should, 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 shouldn't supposed to do. Yep. Yep. Security measure more than anything. Yeah. 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 Okay. Makes sense. It's just good practice. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Uh, and then there's the actual request to commit the changes. Uh-huh. We get the pro, uh, project ID that is the path of the. It can use the path of the project. Yeah. So we just grab it from the repository URL. Uh -huh. it, yeah, and I think you probably saw at one point like I, so in the plenty.json file where you're doing all the configuration, I was just adding all the URL into one thing. So, you know, you could pull the GitLab part out, you could pull the, the group out and you could pull the project out. And I think you saw that I was doing that. And it seems like you're carrying on that tradition here. Is that well, so? It's still a one URL. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just been parsed here with the URL. Object. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. So we can get the path name from sure. there. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> I was just thinking if this, if that this breaks, if does this break, if uh, the repository URL is wrong. Hmm. But it, it doesn't probably matter because you cannot get here before you are authenticated. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, but you potentially could authenticate but have your configuration wrong right and to have a you could authenticate to valid as a valid gitlab user but not have your repository set up to the right place like trying to write the a project that you don't have access to or something yeah you could not have access to the repository although you have logged into gitlab yeah so we should probably check somewhere in the authentication process that the user has the permission to write to the repository. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know what the best place, I mean, you could do that at the point of when someone tries to publish, right? I mean, that could be errors saying, Hey, you're trying to publish this thing you don't have access to. Um, yeah. But why do you want to log in if you cannot write that repository? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I would assume the case would be that someone, you know, misspelled their own repository. It, you know what I mean? But yeah. 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 Oh, I get what you're saying. Oh, oh I see. Because you're, you're right. Because somebody could log on, like on my published site, somebody with, yeah. with a GitLab could log in. Like, there's no point to that. Anyone can... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. You probably want to make it so they can't even log in if they don't have access to the repo. That, that's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, yeah. No, good thinking. Um, yeah. Then there's some headers to uh, set the, for example, the access token. Uh huh. I was actually, <laughs> um, like an hour ago, I realized that it's not private token as the documentation says, 
Oh. It's an under uh, OAuth documentation that it says use, use authorization header. Huh, okay. Interesting. But under API documentation, it says you should use private token. So yeah. huh. it works this way, not the other way. Okay, interesting. Hey, and you get to use template literals there since you're, we're not compiling it. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, true. I still have to look into that a little more. Uh, won't bug us down, but that's something I still have to do. Mm, then we set the payload that we sent with, via the post request. Mm -hmm. So this is the JSON that will be sent. Okay. And we said, say what branch we want to write to and write what commit message, mm -hmm. what actions should be done in, in that commit. Yeah. This is really easy API to make a commit. Yeah. To Git. Yep. There's, yeah. there's a, another way to do it with Git via HTTP or something like that. that mm. <laughs> there's no easy to use API for it. It's mm -hmm. just you have to manually move the point pointer that I did it from the previous pro, for the previous project. You have to manually point the branch to the next commit when you mm. write it after you write it to the <laughs> yeah to the repository. That's a lot as, a, as an object. So it's yeah. really low level. Yeah, yeah, this seems better. <laughs> yeah, this is much better. Yeah, and so at some point the branch will be something that we pull out of our config, and then we might also, you know, want to parameterize something like, mm. uh, you know, uh, commit by and then username or something like that. Just so we have some kind of context yeah. there. Although that is probably that might be recorded naturally. I don't know. It is recording oh. automatically. Awesome, great. Because you are logged in with a GitLab oh. account. It yep. uses that GitLab account to author of these commits. Yeah, makes makes sense. Okay, that's great. Yeah, but maybe I was thinking when I saw this branch parameter, that, mm -hmm. um, maybe we could sometime like, um, in some point, create, um, create, um, like, uh, to cre uh, create an action to create a branch. Mm -hmm. Like a feature branch? Uh, yeah, like mm -hmm. a branch for the before publication. Yep. Branch like develop, not developing, but uh, content edi edition branch. Yeah. Yeah. So there's you name name it whatever you want and then yeah. get the content in different places and then publish it later. Yep. I think you think or whatever you use as default. Yeah, you're thinking exactly the right way, I think, because um so Netlify is doing something like this. So they have a couple of concepts. One is like mm -hmm. the the concept of drafts. Um yeah. and you can they basically create like um you know a feature branch or a develop branch that's not into the main. So it doesn't actually kick off CI, but it, it gets into the code repository so people can review it before pulling it in. Um that's one co concept that's pretty cool. The other one is um I think they called it open authoring at one point. I'm not sure if that's what the name that they, that they use currently, but it was basically the idea that you could potentially open up your your website to anybody to make edits, right? So, you know, oftentimes this is documentation sites. People are like, hey, fork us on GitHub and then make a change or whatever. This would, the, the concept of open authoring would allow anybody to go to your site, log in and make a PR, um, which wouldn't necessarily change the site for other users, but it would... Um, allow the admin team to review your changes then pull them in or deny them as they see fit so mm. it's kind of a cool concept right it kind of like opens up the whole publishing uh universe to, to everybody who's interested in yeah. the project um so so yeah i could see some really interesting things happening in this space for sure um i you're, you're dead on getting the simple thing working first is is exactly mm. right so this is great yeah there's actually not much else to so Okay. Yeah. Well, this is awesome. Um, and so and this is a, so this is a, a local plenty project in terms of, um, of getting this kind of thing pulled into, um, like the, the plenty project. Is that something that you would uh, make another, uh, PR for or is there things that are, are holding you up from doing that kind of work? Um, yeah, I could do that that way because yeah, why not? Perfect. 
Yeah, I think you know this is exa- I think this is exactly the right way to do it. You know, you, you build mm-hmm. a plenty of project, you, you tweak it, you fix it. Um, but the more we can get it into the project, I think uh, the better. I think it's it's good yeah. to start incorporating that stuff. Um, but of course, like you know, you let me know where that that point is. So you, if you have more tweaking and you want to work off this and it's just quicker, um, then then by all means keep keep doing this. But um, yeah, every once in a while when we have bundled things to pull in, I think it's cool to to pull it in so other people can start playing with it too. Yeah, I I could try to keep the PRs as little as possible so we can yeah. we can pull the, those in as as we progress. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Um, I don't know. Is this could be one point actually, mm-hmm. but the branch name mm-hmm. is still a, because um a problem because people use dif- different default branch names. Yep, yep, yeah. So, um, but maybe I can uh, uh, get the branch name somehow from the API. Yeah, I was wondering that because there, there's you set a default branch right in the yeah. repository, so we might be able to get that from that and. And even if, so if that be, proves difficult or complex, then maybe we just set it as something that you set in your config, right? You say, hey, here's my repository and I use this branch as my main branch. Mm. Um, that's one way we could do it potentially. But and that's probably better way to do it because yeah. you always don't want to push to the default branch. Yeah, 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 that's true. That's true. Yeah, some people might want to purposely set it up to push to develop or whatever. Yeah. Um, um, and then, yeah, thinking through, I mean, but at some point we might want to, I don't know, it, it, at some point, I like, think the things you're thinking about are right, right? So we might want to just figure out what the default branch is, push that as live commits, and then drafts or open authoring or other types of commits, we would automatically create um, some kind of a branching technique. That might be ultimately what we do, because if we, I wonder what the complication will be too much if we, you know, we let the user set their own branches, and then they set it as a non-production branch and then we start doing open authoring and stuff like that off of that if, if we're start, if we're getting too confusing with it but um i don't know maybe maybe that's not a big deal just uh thinking yeah. through that stuff i was thinking if we should name the branches different like have a map of branches like hmm, like for example draft branch would be a <laughs> some 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 branch and the live branch should, should be one yeah yeah and i wonder if we should prefix them with like pl- you know plenty draft plenty live or something like that i, I don't know um, um, yeah um yeah i don't know i mean and part of me wonders if you know because then if we if we do like a live branch then people are gonna have to know how to set up their their default as live um yeah but i was thinking if we if it would be gone for a couple configurable from the config file. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it, yeah. there's, a, um, there's defaults for the branch names for live and draft, mm-hmm. but you could change them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, these are good questions. I don't know. I, I would say that um, in terms of like priority, I. This stuff is definitely good to be thinking about. And I think the more we think about it, we'll come to better solutions as, you know, <laughs> when you think about it before bed or taking a shower or whatever, the heck, that's when my ideas come to me. Um, but I, I wonder if for now, like now that we have the commit kind of working, if we want to start focusing on more of the editor experience, is that is that what you kind of see as the next big thing that we have to... Yeah, I was, I was actually thinking the same. Yeah. Because for now it's like, okay, you, you push to one branch, we, we specify it. Um, and maybe the user can specify it. that's fine too but um yeah maybe, maybe for now like that's what we do and then uh later we can make that experience better and more i uh, I, I think it you know it's cart before the horse if we make that experience completely fleshed out but you know the editing experience is a little rough um so yeah, yeah. but but this is great work jesse i think it's we we're, we finally have like that full kind of workflow and I, i'm sure there's some rough edges still and everything but like this is exactly getting the what i'd consider an mvp the minimum viable product out there where yeah. you can log in and do it and, and see the changes back so i think that's really great um maybe and then I'll just add some feedback to it and then like feedback for the user that it has been published or there's an error and yeah then create the pr 
Yeah, I think, yeah, getting some basic, um, yeah, feedback. And again, I wouldn't even worry too much about, you know, stylistically what it looks like at this point. Um, but yeah, getting some, you know, thinking through those things like, okay, if someone were to do this action and it didn't work or they're, you know, they're logged in, but not to the right repository, like what does that experience look like? Do they get error messages? Do they get some feedback? Um, I, I think seeing around those corners is definitely good. And then um, once you have, you feel like you're in a good place of that. And of course, you're not going to see every scenario, but once you feel like you're good there, then um, incorporating that stuff into the Plunder repository would be awesome. And then I think it's like, again, moving on to the next step of what's this editor experience going to be like? And I should probably start thinking through some of that too, um, just to, to make sure that we're on the same page there. Um, I think this is going to be a, a bit of an iterative process that's going to take some time, right? So stage one is like, okay, what, what can a non-technical person use? And um, just edit basic page content. And then we have to think through later on, okay, how could someone potentially reorder components and add new components on the page? And then how, how does a developer rig that up without having to do a bunch of scaffolding every time. Like how, how can some of this functionality be discovered through the project structure without the developer having to think about building a CMS? And these, yeah. I think, you know, these are big questions that are going to take some, some hashing out to get through, but um, I'm really excited about it. I feel like the the bones are there now and, and I'm really excited to see where this is going to get built out. It's really the creative part of the process uh, now, I think. Yeah. Cool. Anything else for the recording? Um, yeah, not, not currently. Okay, let me stop that.